So good to be with you, uh, Professor Michael Gazaniga, today to talk about your new book, uh, Who's in Charge? Free Will and the Science of the Brain. Uh, let me pick up actually right on the title. Uh, you have uh, free will in it. It's a little hard to miss. And mm -hmm. that is a concept mm -hmm. that has been around for centuries, millennia, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's been a major thorny and controversial mm -hmm. debate for so many years. So why now is there something new to say about it? I think uh, the occasion to uh, think I had something to say about it was uh, to give a series of, of lectures where you pulled together 60 years of brain research. And in doing that, uh, one can't help but think of the brain from a very mechanistic point of view how the brain works, how it does its stuff. And there's been, you know, incredible advances in the last 60, 70 years on that topic. And you walk away with the view that, well, this is how the brain works. And uh, then you ask yourself the question, well, given we're kind of understanding how the brain works, where, where does this concept of free will fit in? And uh, I basically come to the conclusion that it's a, a concept whose time has come to uh, be abandoned. And the reasons why and what to do about it are what the book's all about. Yes. So it, it grows out of the fact that 60 years ago, the philosophers writing on this, and certainly hundreds of thousands of years ago, they didn't know what we now know about how the brain works. And we're going to get to that in great depth. But you're a neuroscientist. Yeah. You're not a philosopher. Right. Uh, but I know that you've had uh, many years to, to start to think deeply about these issues during your involvement uh, in a years-long project called the uh, MacArthur uh, Law and Neurosciences Project. Right. Can, can you talk a bit about that? I believe you were a director of it. Right, right. So the MacArthur Foundation uh, launched a project. Actually, it was uh, went on for about four years, uh, where they were looking at, uh, are there findings in neuroscience that are going to impact the law and the judicial uh, thinking? And uh, so we pulled together a group of neuroscientists, of lawyers, and philosophers to look at it. And we, we came across any of a number of, of great issues. We launched a lot of research. And the project now continues. They've, they've whittled it down to a, a smaller effort, but it continues now uh, under the direction of Owen Jones at Vanderbilt. But the project continues because there's going to be so much neuroscience that's brought into the courtroom at some point. What we determined, and what I certainly determined uh, during my my uh, time on the on the task, is that it's not ready yet. That the neuroscience is, is premature, and I think most neuroscientists in the end think that, and I think most most lawyers do too. But it's coming, and to not see it is it would be a big mistake. And it's the kind of information of, 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 it's of a nature that we have to start thinking about it now. Yeah. And you uh, actually had a, almost a dry run of this book in the Gifford Lectures that you gave in Scotland. Right. Can you say a little bit about that series? Right. So the Gifford Lectures uh, were, uh, a, there are a series of lectures given uh, at, uh, at the University of Edinburgh, and uh, they come out of Lord Gifford's wish to uh, talk about heavy matters, uh, but uh, do not be afraid of, of natural theology, and do not be afraid to bring in science, basically. So there's been... Very distinguished people uh, give these lectures. Uh, many physicists, Niels Bohr, uh, uh, and ma ma many others, and, and great theologians. And so it came time to have a brain guy kind of uh, represent some of these issues and talk about them. So it fell to me, and it was a great honor and, and, and uh, a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Actually, you follow in great footsteps in uh, uh, psychology. Uh, Talking, if we call, if, if in a way we're talking now about the neuroscience of psychology, I know William James gave that talk in 19, he did. 1900. He, he, father right. of American psychology. It's the father of American, and, and his varieties of religious experience uh, came out of yeah. uh, those lectures. Back then, you had to give 20 lectures. Uh, we it's now been reduced to yeah, six. He gave which, six. It still takes seemed, a lot out of you. <laughs> it takes a lot of you. I can imagine. Um, well, now I know you're also called the uh, the father. If, if William James is the father of American psychology, you're actually called the father of cognitive neuroscience. And I know that story involves a taxi cab, but tell mm -hmm. us more about that. Well, uh, the story uh, that, that really has had legs. That story. The the story really is uh, came out of a, 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 an interaction that George Miller, the great psychologist who was at Rockefeller University. Uh, 
George Miller and I, uh, the relationship we, we had when I was at Cornell Medical School, and we used to meet regularly. And at that time, in the early 80s, late 70s, there was uh, plenty of neuroscience and there was plenty of cognitive science, but they didn't really connect. Uh, and the intricate theories and modeling of, of cognitive science were not in any way shaped by neuroscientific findings. And then as we've discussed on many, 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 many occasions, we finally said, you know, there really is a field here called cognitive neuroscience. And so it was born out of uh, a, a realization that, uh, and, and, and when we started, it was mostly by, it came from just studying patients with focal lesions and looking at their incredibly interesting disorders from a cognitive standpoint. Cognitive meaning. Co cognitive meaning of uh, thought processes, memory, uh, of course, perceptions always in their attentional disarrays and, 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 and the like. It was not, um, in, in the first instance, it was not dealing with psychiatric issues. Uh, that's changed, uh, and it's much more inclusive now, but it, it, it was, probably reflected a little more than the fact that the group that uh, was pulled together was neurologic in nature, and cognitive in nature. Yeah. If we had one more person at the table like you, <laughs> it might have been called something else. Psychiatric. <laughs> <clears throat> now, now I want to turn to the brain itself because, yeah. of course, a lot of the book is about that and, and also uh, your whole career has been spent studying, studying the brain. and. Um, how I'd like you to talk a bit about uh, how the brain is organized, the, the, the elements of, of uh, uh, functional organization that have relevance for what's really the $64,000 question in this whole enterprise, which is responsibility and our, and our thoughts about that. Mm -hmm. So the, what, one of the uh, points I tried to build to after showing that the brain really is a, uh, has a lot of structure, a lot of complexity built into its structure, and that the brain comes with a lot of uh, stuff, as in it were. It has it has the ability to process information in particular ways. It's not learning everything from uh, bootstraps up. And uh, these, uh, the basic neurobiology and the basic psychology came out of a time when people not so long ago, 50, 50, 60 years ago, where they thought that. They thought you learned mm -hmm. everything. And the brain was just a bowl of mush. Right. Well, that's just not true. Then uh, we learned, as we learned, started to know more about the human cases, how there are great specializations in the human brain, and they're apparently they run in parallel and distributed, is the phraseology people use. They're all over the place, and they're interconnected. And so you really have a cacophony of processes ongoing at all times, carrying out the business of the brain, of making decisions, of existing, just like y you and me. And fully appreciating that, the nature of that, and that, oh, that these things are going on in different time courses and all the rest of it, uh, just makes it almost uh, silly to think that there's a thing in there calling the shots. Mm -hmm. This thing runs in a particular way. We, as humans, always look for an essentialism that, well, that thing must have a something in there, just like uh, a, a person. You remember the movie Men in Black when they, they mm -hmm. pop? Yeah. There's a little guy in there is pulling the thing, and it's, that's just not the way it works. And so, getting to that point, then uh, in the book and going through the experiments over the years that have shown that, uh, then you get to the question: Well, what what does it, what's this free will thing all about, and uh, how do we think about it? Right. And you you speak a lot about automatic brains. Right. <coughs> Pardon me. <clears throat> and you talk about your research on split brains. Can can you? Speak a bit about that now. Sure. So these were patients that were operated on uh, starting uh, almost 50 years ago today. And um, these were patients who had epilepsy. And the idea in disconnecting their hemispheres was to uh, have patients who might have a seizure, and but the seizure would be located to one half brain, keeping the other seizure free. And therefore, the patients uh, would not go into a generalized convulsion. So that was the medical. Uh, side of the story, and uh, what what I did uh, with Roger Sperry uh, goes starting in 1961, is we measured the cognitive and perceptual capacities of each hemisphere, showed their differences, and uh, then began to uh, examine uh, um, uh, how some things did interact across the brains, even though they were cut, but most things didn't, 
and so forth. And out of this came the notion again, emphasizing the modular specialization, lateral specialization of the